in the thick of it last session of the day is this where you want to be if not get out <laughs> it is. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this B-Sides event very important St. Mary's University where you are USAA Trend Micro Digital Offense Digital Defense not Offense SANS National Security Agency Exabeam Accenture Federal Services Open Security Titanium Level CyberSec Jobs, Denim Group, Alamo ISSA, Landmark Solutions, Texas Cyber Summit, also some other of the events supporters, Bobcat Locksport, Kudu Dynamics. Those of you that did not find the raffle prize at the registration desk, be sure to get that before the end of the day. And now we're going to hear from two very important people. Bill Weiss and Suchi Pahi are going to talk to us about talking to lawyers without catching a case or as counsel advises. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Blue, our <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not going to read all that. That is who we are. Uh, we both work for a company called Rally Health. It's a DC based uh, digital wellness platform. Yeah. Is that what we call it? Yep. Yeah. Um, done a lot of things. I am a manager of security there and of the network team. Uh, I was at a law firm doing cybersecurity and data privacy for about five years and then had the pleasure of joining Rally Health to work on some really fun tech law stuff. Um, just a couple of notes that I have to make. I'm not your lawyer. You are not my clients. This is all purely informational. It is not legal advice. Um, and I'm really excited to share all of this with you guys. So. Um, and we're down to person, John Nichols, on assignment. Um, you get us. You'll have an opinion about half an hour if that's good or bad. <laughs> we already talked about that, that happened. I'm blowing it already. Yeah, I'm sorry. you are, but it's okay. All right. Uh, so, why do you care about this? Knowing these things can make a big difference in whenever at your company bad things happen. Um, if you have inc an incident that you have to respond to, you have to deal with problematic customers or partners, you have to deal with people in suits, you're going to need to know this, right? So whenever people threaten like there might be a lawsuit or something like that, uh, sometimes you get an idea that it's going to be like a couple hours of a trial, maybe you've seen some shows. It's not actually how that works. So when I had clients who had to go through litigation, they had to prep with me for a couple hours out of their work day. Then they had to go do their normal work stuff and then see me again. And this would repeat for probably like two weeks. And then they had to sit down with me and opposing counsel for the other party and answer a bunch of questions. And then they had to show up for trial if they were chosen as witnesses. So it's basically the most miserable situation you can find yourself in um, other than being part of a security team during an incident anyway. So, which a lot of uh, CSOs have definitely just quit their jobs during that time because they've had to deal with the, the crazy uh, goat rodeo that ensues. So we want to get you to a place where you're comfortable with your lawyers and your rest of your company so that you don't ever have to really work with people like me to be in that kind of a shit show. So pardon my language. Try not to swear. It's already I know. started. I know. Um, and we've both seen what this has looked like in places that did it well and ones that didn't. Right. And so, uh, just a format before we get really started. Uh, questions at the end, if you would. Right? Uh, if your question starts with, this is not a question, but please just stop. We're going to leave plenty of time. And we've asked that we turn off the cameras for Q&A because people, when they have questions about this, tend to talk about things that maybe you don't want on camera, on YouTube. And so we'll just cut the mic at that point. And um, as you would guess, we are talking about things that have happened in a variety of places. We're not saying these happened at our employer. None of the bad ones happened at our employer. We're talking, telling stories about from friends, from people we've worked with. Hundreds never. of clients. It's yeah, there's an entire industry's worth of stories, and I think we have more than enough between the two of us. So please don't say, oh, Rally had this bad time, because they talked, nope. <laughs> Those stories will happen far later. OK, so dotted lines and dashed lines. And fair warning, and actually, I'm just going to walk over here. So fair warning that 
this is about to get into some corporate structure information, and so I just need you to hang in there with me through this slide and the next slide, and I think potentially the slide after it. But I'll try to keep it interesting. So before we switch slides, dotted lines are typically, dotted and dashed lines actually, are typically people who report across to one another, so you're not necessarily reporting up, you're just kind of like buddies. Um, and then solid lines up would be reporting directly up, or the dash line can mean that you're not really having a relationship inside of the corporation, so you can see where this gets complicated. Um, go ahead. Thanks, Bill. You bet. Okay, figuring out corporate structures. You want to work with your legal team or your legal person, but you need to first figure out where the heck they are, right? So sometimes you'll have companies that have a general counsel, and that's someone who works with your C-suite or your board. Um, and then you have a legal department under them. And it might be a robust legal department with like 15 to 20 lawyers, maybe hundreds, depending on how big your company is. Or it might be a small legal department that's got like three people, including the GC. You could also have what we call outside counsel. And these are the attorneys you pay lots of money to who do not sit within your company. And they might team with your general counsel or like a dedicated attorney. Um, you could also have an outside counsel who acts as a general counsel for you guys. And in that case, they're probably still charging a lot of money, but they might sit within the company for a little while, like a couple days a week, and then go deal with other clients later. It really depends on the terms of their agreement. Um, you could also have a chief privacy officer plus your general counsel, which is if you have a privacy department that sits outside of legal, and you could have a chief legal officer who is potentially like a general counsel and then have a legal department attached with that chief legal officer, which is kind of the same setup as the first bullet point. What I didn't include in here, and that's why there's question marks, is that you have endless iterations of what this could be. Depending on the size of your company, you might also have uh, risk management, compliance, um, and perhaps people sitting within security that actually report into legal as well. So, let it go. Am I still on this one? Next. No, you're good. Oh, I was supposed to tell a story there. Yeah. Story time. Ah. I like story time. Uh, I want to talk about this. So uh, a previous employer of mine, name uh, not to be given, didn't have lawyers for a while. They were small. You know, when you're a tiny company, you don't have lawyers, and so you you do a lot of things. You sign contracts. You, you hustle to make money. And we've gotten big enough where we have a lawyer. Yay. Said lawyer comes to me one day and goes, Bill, uh, I'm sure the answer to this is, is fine, but you need to tell me what it is. Uh, we asserted this company that we do ITAR correctly, and so we've never like sold the software or allowed anybody to download on the public website. Um, anything, if they're from one of the countries we can't talk to, or like people are on like the list, right? We do that, right? Like, How does that work with the open source portion? Not the answer she wanted. Yeah. Um, the answer after quite a lot of hassle and a bunch of those people, <laughs> mostly the outside, was we're just going like, to redline that off the contract and see if they notice. <laughs> and then yeah. having to make a bunch of technical changes that cost us some time is great. Yeah. Uh, and that boiled down to like nobody at the time had read that contract because we didn't have a lawyer. And so nobody had said, like, that looks hard. Let's ask if they care about that. Yeah, that's why, like, when Bill first told me that story, that caused major heartburn and anxiety to me. Because I could not imagine being either the company or the lawyer who found that out, because that's ter terrifying. I'm terrified right now. So, yeah. It was all fun, by the way. It was totally fun. So, if you don't already know or have a relationship with the lawyers within your company or who service your company, it's really incumbent on you guys to, like, put out some feelers, figure out who that person is, and, and get to know them. It could be people who work on contracts for you guys as part of your security team, or who work on contracts for your IT team. Like, I'm not really sure. It depends on how you're structured with your technology and your security. Um, it could be the person who's running training down to the entire company. Um, and it could be your incident response attorney. No guarantees there. Hopefully you have an incident response attorney, but we'll get to that later. So, Yeah, find your lawyer, and then you're going to go talk to them. That's part two. So now you found them, right? You know where your lawyer is. Hopefully the answer isn't we don't have one. 
you should talk to them early, right? You should know this person well before things have gone wrong. You keep a couple things in mind, right? Um, if someone is a lawyer, they went through a lot of painful schooling and classes about things that I can't fathom. Uh, and they know a lot, right? But they're not technical, they're not hackers, they don't know what we do, and vice versa, right? And so you need to master like hitting the, I'm giving you the important details, and I can explain further, but I'm not gonna like nerd out on this stuff. We're not talking about malware, we're not talking about reversing techniques. We're talking about like, I think this server might have a new admin today, and we don't know them. And never, when you're talking to your lawyer about potential problems, talk about a thing you, like don't make conclusions, right? You wanna say, hey, these things happened. What do you think of that? Yeah. Is that bad? I think it's bad, you tell me. And you need to be really clear, and this is something that was hard for me to learn, and I had to learn through painful repetition, about like this happened, whereas like this happened, like I think this happened, because the answer is gonna be really different, right? If you say like this machine is, is it, not saying that word, uh, this machine has been hacked, versus like I think this, there's something weird with this machine, like what do we do? Those are very different, because the conclusions are gonna be different. So, sort of to piggyback off of that one, part of a lawyer's job when you talk to them is to frame the things that you're telling them. And it involves, it's, it's almost like being an, an artist in a sense. I'm in a sense. I'm trying to find the broad strokes of what you're saying and figure out where we want to go. And so I'm looking at it from a legal risk perspective and then like a 10,000 foot view of where the pitfalls might be depending on any which option is next. So it's like a choose your own adventure, but based on law school and then the information that you've given me from the security side. Um, it can actually be really fun sometimes. If you have a great relationship, like Bill and I work together regularly, if you have a really good relationship or a partnership, then you can get a lot of things done that are beneficial to the company and kind of grow things in the right direction. Um, so what I really like is, hey, how bad would this be? Which is very proactive versus, hey, we um, have a problem, this is what happened. I don't wanna come in on the back end of it as your legal person. I wanna help you move towards your goal um, by proactively working with you before you get there. If you're working with like, outside counsel, uh, calls like this, like, hey, what do you think, can be really expensive. And there's probably someone in between that you should be talking to before you make that call to your outside counsel, unless it's someone who you've hired to work within your company as GC. Um, so I would be careful with how you frame the situations and not be super open-ended, uh, which you learn by experience. But I wouldn't ever hesitate to pick up the phone and ask for advice before taking a step that might poorly mess up wherever you're actually trying to get to. And then there's a piece of this that's not incident related, and that's your vendors or your contracting. So if you're trying to work with a vendor or something along those lines, give us the contracts or the paperwork early, loop us in early with like the who, what, where, when, why, and how, and that way we can help you with the vendor contracting side of it too, so. It has made a massive difference once I learned that instead of legal being the last step in contracts, where I go, okay, I figured this all out, like, please sign this, tell me if it's wrong, way earlier saying like, is this, even gonna work, like is this a thing we should do? So that we don't have months of effort before legal says we, that's not a thing you get to do, sorry. Yeah. Or you can do it, but it's a terrible idea. So.
really been involved in. Alright, so totally hypothetical, uh, had a bad day, right? You know that you're hacked, you think that you're hacked. So you fire up your instant response team, right? Everybody like gets in a room, you buy some pizza, you like start looking at stuff. And you spend a while doing it, and so you know, you get into a mode, and so you start getting a little reckless about what you say, maybe, right? And so you in chat say things like ah. They got, this machine got hit, like, we told them they should have patched it. Like, that was three months ago. Why did they not? Like, we told you. Or, like, oh, that's totally customer data and that S3 bucket's public. Like, whoops. Or, um, is this a thing we have to notify about? Like, do we have to talk to, do we have to tell people about this thing? Nah, it's fine. And then, you know, so you've, you've chatted, you fix it up, you like, you clean up the machines, you patch some stuff, you like chastise the user, or you like do some training, whatever. Great, that's life. And then, three months later, your boss goes, hey, like, remember Infrequent Sunshine where we had that bad day? Yeah, we're getting sued. And so they have to see uh, all the communications about it. And you didn't talk to legal, so legal's finding out about infrequent sunshine right there. They're already not happy. And we're just gonna have to give them all of our chat history about that incident. So when, when you said, like, haha, we, they should have patched that, um, that means you knew that that could have gone badly back when you said that, and you didn't take care of it, which looks maybe neglectful, maybe. Oh, like there was customer data in that S3 bucket. Like that's not the sort of thing you should be doing. Contracts talk about commercially reasonable actions sometimes, and we didn't do that. And so all those contracts where we said we did those things, we may not have done right. Uh, like, but who would ever do that? Don't show hands, please. That's don't don't do that. <laughs> like, oh, I wonder. Now nah, we don't need to notify. Uh, some of those laws like have timers. If you get like 48 hours or 72 hours to like talk to the feds or talk to a state government or whatever, and you like got out your chess clock and like hit it real hard when you said that in chat, and you probably didn't do the right thing about it. And so, as Suja said earlier, like you're going to court. <laughs> going to court's bad, right? So if only there was some way to like go back in time and say, how do we keep ourselves from going to court and maybe looking like jerks in front of our customers and losing them? So instead, now that you've seen this talk, talk to your lawyers, um, you, before you start the IR machine, you go talk to your friendly lawyer. Ta -da. You say, hey, um, this might have happened. We, I think we had a bad day. What would you like me to do about it? And you say, I'm gonna say, go look into it, but before you do anything, Let's make sure everything is privileged and confidential. And this actually ends up being a whole conversation about making sure that you're talking to the right people and only talking to those people and doing certain things during your investigation to make sure to retain particular types of records and stuff like that. So there's a whole process that comes into this from the legal side that should be started with just that, hey, we noticed something funny. So. And that starts the Provision <laughs> Confidential Party. I'm super happy that that's animated because it wasn't in the previous. <laughs> this is actually a good phrase for this because like we're working uh, on security incidents actually across all of the companies. Every security team I've worked with has just been like, why do I have to put privileged and confidential everywhere? Uh, and it really is a privileged and confidential party. Like that is. <laughs> Everything is privileged and confident. It's amazing. Um, and there's a lot of nuance around that, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then I do have a resource for you guys at the end as well. So. Jump ahead. Yeah. Oh, cool. So now you're not just doing incident response from the security team side. And basically, your lawyer is like, hey, go look into this so that I can give you legal advice uh, about the situation and help handle it. And that's when you get to the communications with your attorney, which is mostly protected from discovery. And so we say mostly because a lot of times people do waive privilege during uh, litigation and through other things that happen. 
running up to litigation. But you want to start from having your information, like your communications and things like that, reports, et cetera, that you've gotten to support yourself during incident response protected. Okay, how many of you know what discovery is? Okay, most of you. So discovery, for those of you who don't know, is a process in which the other side gets to ask for basically everything under the sun, and you get to do the same to them, and then some poor sorry person has to go through all of those files um, and figure out what's really juicy and then pick who they want to talk to and what the facts look like. So it's, it's a giant process that can take a lot of time, especially if you're involved in litigation with very large companies. Um, so using that previous non-lawyer IR, um, you have now a lawyered IR, so maybe there won't be someone going through all of your chat transcripts trying to figure everything out. So. And it's important to point out, it has to be your lawyer, right? At the beginning of the talk, when it's like, she's not your lawyer, that matters. <laughs> it can't just be any lawyer. Uh, could we hold questions till the end? Okay. If, if, if you have a like technical thing, go ahead. But otherwise, let's wait till the end. Just a quick definition of the difference between privileged and confidential. That's not going to be quick in any <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> But I appreciate that question. I'm told in law school, like that middle sentence there is like a class. <laughs> that mostly asterisk, or mostly asterisk, <laughs> is a while. Good? Yeah. So, let's talk about how to do this, right? Let's learn you a uh, get a lawyer. Uh, first off, get a lawyer. If you have, if you're a small shop, you need to have one on retainer, right? The worst time to shop for anything and like negotiate prices is when you're in trouble and need it. And that includes people who charge eye-watering amounts of money to talk to you, right? Whereas a retainer is like an agreement that maybe I'm going to have to call you someday and need some help, and we'll put some money down to do that. If you have regulatory concerns, right, if anybody's going to like go to jail if you mess this up, or if anybody's going to end up in the news, you need to have a lawyer. And if you're a, com if you're a big company that has, what's some regulation that we don't care about at work? Uh, <laughs> Pretend something that some, <laughs> something juicy, some like oil and gas industry thing. Like you have to have a lawyer. You just have to have one, and so go find them. If you don't have a lawyer and you need a retainer, like ask around for references. This is not, by and large, like super competitive, sensitive stuff, right? You can just ask people in your industry, like who do you talk to about this stuff? Help yeah. me out, because there's people out there, like in art, like in the security industry, who are like bad at this. And much like security, like getting the wrong firm to do your instant response or your, your lawyering could be terrible. Yeah, at the least ask for who not to go talk to. Yeah. Like at least do that much because once someone does a bad job on this, I'm, I mean, they'll wreck things and their clients will know and will be angry about it. So you can just find out beforehand and not go through that experience yourselves. So. And so then once you have that person identified and you either work with them or you've given them a sack of cash, um, then go talk to them and make sure that you know each other and have figured some of this out before things are on fire. Right? Because you don't want to, during the incident response process where time matters, then have to go, what is happening out there? Yeah. Oh, she's like, dang, how do I, how do I get, uh, no. Yeah, you want your IR lawyer on speed dial, or at least you want your legal team to have them on speed dial, your legal team roped into what you're doing. And also, just like free tip, if a lawyer is trying to get your business and they work for a law firm, so if you're going to outside counsel, they can charge their own company to take you to lunch and take you to coffee. So if you need them to take you out so you can talk to them kind of like what your company is like, it's like dating, let them take you out and then you go have that conversation and you date your lawyers until you find one that you find works for you. Uh, and most lawyers at bigger firms will do that. And so then you can find a lawyer who you kind of connect with and also understands your business and uh, where you guys are going and what some of the intricacies can be. So. And you probably don't need to actually pay them thousands or more dollars an hour to like have that lunch. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I really like it when I hear these phrases. Hey, let's talk about some stuff. Hey, do you have a minute? Let's grab a room to talk. Um, I know something's up and I know I need to be attentive, but at the same time, you haven't said anything that starts any type of uh, legal issues going or notification obligations going or anything like that. So I'm not panicked, but I know that something's going on and you need some assistance. 
Yeah. That's the way to get the attention. Um, we, not everybody has to do it like this, but it works for us. Um, we give, sorry, Suchi, Suchi's number to basically everybody who might find an incident on the security team, okay. right? And the deal is, if you get a text from one of those people, it's like, do you have a minute? It, it might matter. Yeah. And we've agreed to not troll each other by being like, hey, do you have a minute? That's when I got. There was a little bit of time where I used to walk up to the security desk and everyone would get really tense and worried because they thought I was coming to them with a, a potential incident or something like that. So uh, that was a lot of fun <laughs> for me. Okay, the trolling agreement is one way. I used to get texts <laughs> like, do you have a minute? Like, oh no, what? Hey, I want to talk about this thing. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Don't start there with your lawyers, though. <laughs> Okay, so after I get that type of information from my security team, um, that's when I start with the whole let's do things privileged, confidential, and- Party cards. Yeah, exactly. And then you guys still get to do everything that you, you need to do. The lawyer's job is not to get in the way of your investigation. If that's what your lawyer is doing, your lawyer is doing it wrong. Um, and you can tell them that, you can hold me to that, you can take that as a quote and just play it on repeat for them, okay? So you set up your incident response team Hopefully you have one. You're working off of your security incident response plan. Hopefully you have one. Um, your lawyers are involved somewhere during the spin up of one and two. Only the people who need to know about the incident are involved in the incident response. And if you need other people, you have a core group that you can actually ask about bringing other people in and make sure it's all approved. Um, and you're working on behalf of the attorneys at the direction of your attorneys, uh, which is which means that your work is more protected than not. And so this gets into work product protections, attorney client privilege, and then confidential slash trade secret language. Um, and like Bill said, each of those is a course or a year long course in its own. So um, it gets complicated quickly. Uh, and if I can say real quick, that all sounds pretty formal and like a lot of work. Uh, you will be so happy if you put an hour into, like, when something's bad, who do we talk to? That's your instant response team, right? Like, do you need to get your CISO involved? Do you need to get people from legal involved? Yes. Do you need to get people from HR involved? Hopefully not. Um, but like, document that beforehand. You will. It will pay dividends every time. And the same for the incident response plan, right? A quick form of, if you've declared an incident, you need to talk about how did you find it? How are you getting rid of it? How do you know you've gotten rid of it? Who did you talk to? That sort of thing. Spend, spend like an hour or two up there and it will pay the first time you have to do this. Because again, much like finding the lawyer, you don't want to figure that out like under fire. Like, oh geez, does our, does our head of counsel need to know about this right now? Like, I don't know. Do we need to talk to marketing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ho hopefully not. lost in the weeds when you come talk to your lawyer buddies because it's, it just isn't important. Like it doesn't help us unless we ask questions that eventually get you to the weeds. So um, what we want to know is what was affected? Was it sensitive data? Was it a sensitive system? And really depending on the company and the type of regulations you're under or your stance on privacy and security, that could be any number of things. Um, could someone have acquired or accessed information? That's something that is actually, you have to vet on like a state by state level, as well as country by country level. So depending on the size of your company and what you're potentially looking at, uh, that analysis could take forever. But from you guys, it would be something like, hey, we think that someone was just like hanging out in our system for the last eight months. And I'm gonna go, okay, what do you mean by hanging out? Like, what were they clicking on? What were they doing? Um, and then what I wanna know at the very end is, what's the likeliest scenario? based on your investigation. Don't tell me all of the different ways in which something may have happened, but give me your like 70 to 80% likelihood or 60, I don't know what you would call not an edge case, so. What feels likely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, especially not like, this is the whole reaching a legal conclusion. A breach can mean something for you guys in InfoSec and cybersecurity that's different from a breach as a legal term. And breach is actually complicated. So compromise, 
breach, and there's a couple of other ones that are defined differently by almost every state law, um, and also by federal regs and by national laws. So you don't want to say it's a breach because that has different meanings for lawyers and on the regulatory side. So you want to find out uh, whatever your terminology of choices within your company to describe like, hey, something's happened. Um, yeah. If I could give a brief story. Uh, way back in the before time, I worked for Department of Energy. I was an intern. And uh, through some terrible choices, they allowed me to be part of the red team as an intern. So they let me like do it live in production on a site of 18,000 devices. And I hacked something. It was great. And I'm like, guys, great news. I compromised this machine. And everybody got very serious. So it turns out in DOE land, what compromise means is you just moved some classified data downstream. And boy, howdy, did I not do that. <laughs> um, but putting that in writing meant that I had like a bunch of unwinding to do. And I had to like talk to people and send a couple of emails. I'm like, my bad. Um, and so you need to ask the lawyers, like, what are those magic words that mean something, right? Um, breach is a common one. Compromise, some organizations. And there's no easy way to know, because it's not like there's a place you look up, like, what are the magic words for healthcare regs in the state of Oklahoma, right? Like that's that's a question you gotta ask a lawyer. Yeah, and you know what? If you do have a conversation with a lawyer where you go, it's a breach. The lawyer's gonna be like, okay, well, what do you mean? And then you're gonna give me a bunch of information. I'm gonna say it depends. You're gonna hate me forever, but it'll get us all to the same point in the end. Hopefully, not a breach. Right. So, and it's true. Like it's it is it is genuinely super context sensitive. All right. Uh, that felt kind of like kind of a lot of material. So, key takeaways, and then we've got question time for sure. Find your lawyer or lawyers. Figure out who the most likely one to hear from you on a bad day is, and like be their friend. Like be nice. Again, super handy to like have Suji's phone number so I can be like, I think I did a bad thing, or I think a bad thing happened. Yeah. Um, I need an adult in the room real quick for a thing we're looking at. Um, in a big org, maybe that's a bunch of lawyers, right? You might have different, different people who do privacy and incident response and contracts and customer negotiations and regular, you know. That might be a lot of people, but you need to know who they are. And you can do this. This is, you, this is within your capability, I promise you. Yeah, keep it simple, uh, but don't gloss over what might be important facts. Uh, like I said, I don't need every technical detail. I don't really need to know like a patch of I don't that doesn't mean okay, it means something to me, but it doesn't mean anything to most of your lawyers. You don't need to sit down and explain salt and hashes to me, like I don't care. Okay. I, I wanna know what's important. Was it encrypted? Um, that's important. I don't need to know the how, the extremely detailed how. I don't need that. So keep it simple when you're talking to your lawyer and you're you're probably gonna get better answers. And related to that, like, put on your I'm talking to a smart person in a related field hat and realize they might ask questions and you need to explain, but like, start start big. And they will do you the same courtesy. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I've said this a couple times over, and that's why it's in the key takeaway. If you can bring legal in early in your incident response process, then you're really setting yourself up for success here. Because there are other things other than privilege and confidential that come into play like uh, litigation holds. And that's something that will come out of your legal department and it's, hey, don't delete or erase anything related to this matter. Don't do anything with that. Um, a lot of times if you're working with uh, uh, something that's been compromised potentially, you'll have to make an image of it to do your investigation so that you're not screwing with the original issue uh, because that might be involved with litigation later as well. So it's important to keep legal early in the process because we can flag that stuff for you and you don't have to do any guesswork and you don't get rid of stuff that's critical later. My experience is that lawyers are never gonna say, you know what, we talk too often. Like, you let me know about a little too much stuff. They might say, okay, for this class of things, we're cool, but they're, they're happy to be brought in because they're not gonna find, they're not gonna get surprised by it later. Um, and this seems, we've said this a couple times, you need to ask what to do, right? When this, the important parts of this is that you are doing things at the direction of your counsel and so you need to actually go and say, hey, like, I, I, I think this, this might have happened. Like, here's what it looks like. Should I do anything about that? Like, what should I do? 
And that's not just a formality. It's actually like they're telling you what things to do and what not to do, and that could matter. Um, and then obviously, like, listen, if you ask your lawyers and then go do something else instead, super bad look for all involved. I see a wince there, but like, <laughs> it's a thing. So this goes back to the, the don't just say something's a breach. And, and if you notice something suspicious, I know almost all of us probably have companies that have chats that you guys use or chat rooms. Um, just be careful with, with what you're really saying in those because you don't want to accidentally cause, cause a breach, which sounds weird, but cause a legal obligation that doesn't actually exist. And then you'll end up with a fake emergency in your hands. So yeah. Okay, about the privilege and confidential oh, totally and work it. product. <laughs> Crap. It is probably, it would have been a link no one will remember. But uh, Wendy Knox Everett gave a really good talk about incident response and privilege and confidential and work product protections at uh, ShmooCon this year. And she works at Leviathan Security and she really broke it down into a nice, easily digestible chart. It's worth your time. I think it was like 11 minutes long. Do you remember? I think it might be half an hour. Okay, it was. It's good. It's it worth was, it. It was well done. So you can find it on YouTube by looking for her name and Shmukan, uh, or you can probably pull it off of her Twitter. She's here. Um, yeah. So we're not like pitching Leviathan Security. They didn't pay us to, to say anything. Wendy didn't pay us to promote her. Um, we just thought that the talk was really good. We both liked it and saw it separately. So it yeah. was really well done. We were texting her and talking like, "This is great. Let's show it to the team." So yeah. Um, so the the. Shmukon has a YouTube playlist every year, so you can just find this year's. It was really early in it. She's probably the only Wendy Knox ever that spoke that year about legal stuff. You can find it. Uh, also, it's totally my bad. I was supposed to put a link in there. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's it. We have questions. So um, if we can kill a recording real quick.